Hi there, welcome back. At this point, your head has stopped spinning. Well, mostly. And you've got a grip on how we obtained a solution to the restricted two-body problem. We're now going to examine and apply that solution, known as the trajectory equation, which will tell us a great deal about the basic forms of both closed and open trajectories. The trajectory equation is a scalar equation, which tells us what the radius is as a function of a number of parameters. Depending on the value of the parameter e, the resulting trajectory can take on a number of different shapes. These shapes are called conic sections, and we'll start by considering one of them here, the ellipse. In the equation, h is the angular momentum, and mu is the gravitational parameter, which is the universal constant g times the mass of the central body m1. In the restricted two-body problem, for which the trajectory equation is valid, both h and mu are constant. It's convenient to represent h squared over mu with a letter p, which is called the semilattice rectum, or sometimes just the parameter. The semilattice rectum is perpendicular to the major axis of the ellipse and represents the distance from m1 to the point where it intersects the ellipse. Next, we note that a is half the length of the major axis, called the semi-major axis. a determines the size of the orbit and is one of the six key constants called Keplerian orbital elements which allows us to fully specify a two-body orbit. The second Keplerian orbital element is the eccentricity E. The eccentricity determines the shape of the orbit. For values of E less than one, the trajectory takes the form of an ellipse, which includes the special case of a circle for which E is zero. The third orbital element is nu, which is called the true anomaly. And this is the angle between the shorter segment of the major axis and the radius vector, which indicates the position of M2, the body whose motion we're actually interested in. You'll notice that the semi-major actress A is currently missing from the trajectory equation. Given that it's one of the Keplerian orbital elements, it would be handy to have it in there as well. So we're going to do a bit of analysis put A where we want it, and develop a few handy relations along the way. First, we're going to look at the point on the trajectory where M2 is closest to M1, and this is called the periapsis. Note that this point can go by other names depending on which central body is M1. If M1 is Earth, we call the closest point perigee. If M1 is the Sun, we call it perihelion, and so forth. In any case, at periapsis, the true anomaly, nu, is zero. When we substitute nu is zero into the trajectory equation, we see that the length of the radius at periapsis, called rp, is equal to p over 1 plus e. Similarly, we can look at the point where m2 is furthest from m1, which is called the apoapsis. Just as before, we could call this point apogee or aphelion, for the Earth or the Sun, respectively. At this point, the true anomaly is equal to pi. We substitute pi for nu in the trajectory equation and see that the radius at apoapsis, Ra, is equal to p over 1 minus e. Fine. Now if you add up the lengths of Rp and Ra, they have the same length as the major axis, which is 2a. So we set that in an equation which, after substituting from above, contains a, p, and e. Then we solve for p, which is equal to a times 1 minus e squared, and substitute that back into the trajectory equation. Now we have an expression for r, which only depends on the three Keplerian orbital elements, a, e, and nu, that we introduced above. Using comparably simple manipulations, another handy relationship can be derived for the eccentricity E. Go ahead and derive this one yourself. It's good practice, 
and it shouldn't take long at all. At this point, we've covered three of the six orbital elements. The remaining three describe how the elliptical trajectory is oriented in three-dimensional space, and we'll cover those later. Nevertheless, with the trajectory equation in hand, we can already conduct a variety of interesting analyses. Let's immediately put our new tools to work on an actual satellite. Let's consider SLOSHSAT, a Dutch experimental satellite whose purpose was to test the dynamics of fluid in orbit. Designed for a 10-day mission, it was launched in 2005 on an Ariane 5 rocket from Kourou in French Guiana, where the primary launch site of ESA is located, that's the European Space Agency. Its mass was 127 kilograms. You can access this type of information via numerous reliable sources, such as NASA, spacetrack.org, or Wolfram Research via Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha. And you can do this using an identification number. SLOSHSAT's ID number is given here for two different catalogs. The SATCAT, or NORAD, catalog number, designated by the U.S. Air Force's U.S. Spacecom, and the International Designator Number, administered by NASA's National Space Science Data Center. As a point of interest, the NORAD catalog number one refers to the final stage of the rocket which launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite ever launched in 1957. Sputnik's success kicked off the space race in earnest which eventually culminated in the six Apollo moon landings. But I digress. Here we have some key orbital data for the satellite, which I obtained via Mathematica. These include the gravitational parameter for the Earth, the average radius of the Earth, and the altitudes at both perigee and apogee. Note that the figures and results are rounded off for this example. Given these data, we're going to find the length of the radius at perigee and apogee, the semi-major axis, and the eccentricity of the orbit. As we've discussed, the radius at perigee is the sum of the radius of the Earth and the altitude at perigee. So RP is 6,650 kilometers. Similarly, the radius at apogee is just under 40,000 kilometers. Now think about this for a moment. This is a decent back-of-the-envelope approximation, but it's certainly not exact, and for a variety of reasons. One notable area for improvement is the fact that we cannot be sure, given this information, that the perigee altitude was measured with respect to the average radius. Perhaps the equatorial radius or some other reference radius was used. Always remember to remain professionally skeptical and understand what you're dealing with what your information is based on. Now, given RP and RA, we can calculate the semi-major axis to be about 23,000 kilometers, and the eccentricity to be about 0.71. Those give us the size and the shape of the orbit. These results can be checked against the reference sites I mentioned, which means that you have a virtually bottomless pit of practice material to work with just what you were looking for. In addition to conducting handy back-of-the-envelope calculations as we've just done, we can also use the trajectory equation to make a number of observations about the general nature of elliptical orbits so that we can get a feel for what's going on. Here we see the variation of the radius for the full range of the true anomaly and for three different eccentricities. The red orbit with the smallest eccentricity of 0.01, shows a nearly constant radius. This orbit is almost circular. If we look at the other two orbits, we note that as the eccentricity increases, the variation in radius also increases. For the most eccentric orbit here, the radius at apogee is nearly 10,000 kilometers, whereas its perigee is perhaps 5,200 kilometers. Hold on a minute. The trajectory equation tells us that the radius at perigee is 5,200 kilometers, uh, but don't forget to use your common sense as an engineer. The radius of the Earth is 
6,370 kilometers, give or take. So this orbit is not feasible in the real world. This is a good point to reemphasize that you should always be clear about what you're dealing with. In this case, it's the radius we're talking about, not the altitude. It's no coincidence that the horizontal axis on this plot is placed where it is. Always make sure to help yourself and make it as easy as possible for your audience to digest what you're telling them. Let's get a feel for what happens to the velocity as well. Here we've plotted the speeds on the same orbits against the true anomaly so that we can see where our spacecraft speeds up and where it slows down. For the red orbit, with the lowest eccentricity, we see that the variation in speed is minimal, similar to the variation in radius before. And the greater the eccentricity, the greater the differences in speed along the orbit. Note also that at perigee, where the true anomaly is zero, the speed is highest. And at apogee, where the true anomaly is 180 degrees, or pi radians, the speed is lowest. We've already seen that the most eccentric orbit is not feasible because of the rather pesky detail that Earth's surface gets in the way. So let's look more closely at the Delft Blue orbit with an eccentricity of 0.1. The perigee altitude for that orbit was 6,750 kilometers, and the apogee altitude was 8,250 kilometers. Now imagine that your spacecraft starts out in a circular orbit at 6750 kilometers, and you want to transfer a, to a different circular orbit at 8250 kilometers. What would you have to do to make the transfer between these two circular orbits happen? Well, one thing you can do is use an elliptical orbit to go from the lower to the higher altitude. Let's first consider the speed of our spacecraft at the lower altitude. On a circular orbit, the speed is a constant 7.68 kilometers per second throughout the orbit. But on an elliptical orbit, for which the perigee altitude is also 6,750 kilometers, the speed at perigee is 8.06 kilometers per second. If our spacecraft starts on the circular orbit, and we want it to be on the elliptical orbit, then we have to change its speed by 0.37 kilometers per second. We call this change a delta V. Once we've done that, we consider the situation when our spacecraft arrives at apogee. And we can calculate that its speed, the speed that it has on the elliptical orbit at apogee, is 6.59 kilometers per second. And the speed it needs to have to be on a circular orbit at that same altitude is 6.95 kilometers per second. So when it gets to apogee, we need to change its velocity again. This time it requires a delta V of 0.36 kilometers per second. In other words, if we want to transfer from a lower circular orbit to a higher one using an elliptical orbit that is just tangent to both, then we need two delta Vs, one at perigee and one at apogee. If we add these delta Vs up, then the total delta V required for this transfer maneuver is 0.73 kilometers per second. Okay, so how do we make this delta V happen? Well, some form of propulsion should do the trick. And given this delta V, we could take the ideal rocket equation and figure out how much propellant we'd need to make it happen. We're making good progress now. The trajectory equation tells us quite a bit about a spacecraft motion in an elliptical orbit. Once we add a few more tools to our toolbox, we'll be well equipped to understand how we get around in space. And you know, you can't be an orbital mechanic without a toolbox. See you next time.